As night descended on April 12, 1972, Navy SEAL Lieutenant Thomas Norris and Petty Officer 3rd Class Wynn Van Kett were stealing themselves for their third rescue attempt. Their mission was clear, to extract Air Force Lieutenant Colonel ICL Gene Hamilton, callsign BAT-21 Bravo, from behind enemy lines. Hamilton, a 53-year-old experienced pilot with critical intelligence knowledge, had been evading capture for over a week. His condition was deteriorating rapidly, and Norris knew that they had to reach him that night, or it might be too late. Disguised as local fishermen, Norris and Wynn set out in their small boat, venturing deep into enemy territory. The cover of darkness provided some concealment, but the sounds of the surrounding enemy were ever-present. The chatter of soldiers, the growl of tank engines, and the ominous presence of a massive force of over 30,000 men. As they silently paddled upriver, Norris and Wynn were acutely aware that their disguises might not hold up under closer scrutiny. With Hamilton's life hanging in the balance, Norris and Wynn were determined to press on, knowing that even if they succeeded in finding him, they would still have to navigate the perilous journey back through enemy territory, where their cover might be blown at any moment. By the spring of 1972, only a few American combat troops remained in Vietnam, and military advisors in the area were preparing the South Vietnamese to continue the fight on their own. Seeing this as a great opportunity, the North began a full-blown invasion. Known as the Easter Offensive, the enemy sent as many ground troops, vehicles, and artillery as possible across the demilitarized zone. As a response, America launched B-52 Strider Fortress bombers and EB-66 electronic warfare aircraft meant to jam missiles aimed at the bombers. But on April 2nd, news broke out that one such EB-66 was shot down right behind North Vietnamese lines. Despite many casualties, one silver lining remained. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel ICL Gene Hamilton had survived the attack. The only survivor of the crash, Hamilton, call sign BAT-21 Bravo, was trapped behind 30,000 heavily fortified enemy soldiers. However, because of the 53-year-old's first-hand knowledge of crucial classified information from the Strategic Air Command, as well as thorough ground-to-air missile expertise, Air Force top brass put his rescue at the top of the priority list. With this, the Vietnam War's largest and most intense search-and-rescue operation began. And from the get-go, it didn't go well. According to Army documents, a series of rescue missions over six days resulted in over a dozen casualties, and six aircraft either damaged or downed. During one such mission, a crash led to two Americans being taken prisoner, while Air Force First Lieutenant Mark Clark, a close air support pilot, became stranded. Now, the Air Force had to rescue both Clark and Hamilton. However, by April 7th, it was becoming clear that an air rescue mission would be impossible. A day later, Marine Colonel Albert Gray, a man who later became the Commandant of the Marine Corps, came up with the idea of a secret land-based rescue mission, stating, quote, I have a boatload of guys who'd love to do something like that. When the Easter Offensive began, Thomas Norris was one of the few Navy, Sea, Air, and Land team members who remained in Vietnam, serving his second tour. Born in 1944, Norris grew up dreaming of becoming a pilot, but when visual and depth perception problems disqualified him, he decided to become part of the U.S. Navy's primary special operations force instead. Nerdy and slight in stature, Tommy Norris didn't exactly fit the profile commonly associated with the military elite. In fact, he initially struggled during SEAL training. However, he was a tough warrior with a heart of gold. According to him, as a 28-year-old, he was chosen for this mission because he was one of the few special operators with previous experience working with South Vietnamese teams. On the night of April 10, 1972, Norris, accompanied by a team of five Vietnamese SEALs, began their mission, a ground operation to recover Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton and Lieutenant Clark from behind enemy lines. Initially, the plan called for the six-man team to swim upriver against the current and have Clark float downstream to meet them. But when the current proved too swift for the frogmen to swim against, the group began an overland insertion along the banks of the river. Moving west, slowly but surely, as they knew their mission could turn deadly with just one wrong move, the group passed columns of enemy tanks, trucks, and frequent patrols. After carefully maneuvering his team all throughout the night, the team was now 1.2 miles behind enemy lines and successfully picked up on Clark's movement. By daybreak, 
Norris found the beleaguered pilot hiding along the banks of the river and convinced him he'd be safe if he followed his lead. Reversing course, the now seven-man team successfully made it back to their forward operating base, where Clark received first aid care. But their mission wasn't complete just yet. Despite the overwhelming number of well-armed enemy forces they witnessed, Tommy Norris and his men were ready to do it all over again, as they still had another American to save. On the night of April 11th, just as the group was about to set out to find Hamilton, the enemy responded in kind, raining hundreds of shells upon the base. In a matter of seconds, the surprise attack brought chaos and destruction to the ARVN outpost, causing two immediate casualties on Norris's team, who had just helped save Clark's life. The following morning, Norris and the remaining three team members, still determined to carry out the rescue mission, devised a new plan. The four men left the outpost after dark on April 12th, ready to rescue Bat-21 Bravo, this time heading upriver more than two and a half miles into the demilitarized zone. As the SEALs saw with their own eyes just how many forces were in the area, two men, scared for their lives, refused to continue. But Norris convinced them that their biggest chance to stay safe was to remain with the team, and the group continued. But as day broke, after two unsuccessful attempts to reach Hamilton, the group had no choice but to withdraw. By then, they knew that the situation for Hamilton was becoming dire. After communicating on and off with the Air Force forward air controller with his radio, they knew that the 53-year-old was growing weak and confused. His directions to his hiding spots were becoming confusing. Time was running out. For their third attempt, knowing two of his men were already too scared and a potential hindrance, Norris and Petty Officer Third Class Wynn Van Kett were the only other SEALs who willingly chose to continue the mission. Together, the men soon received details on Hamilton's location from a forward air controller, and for their most daring effort yet, the duo then disguised themselves as fishermen and floated all night in a sampan, a small Vietnamese canoe, passing numerous enemy encampments along the way. At dawn, they found Hamilton where he was expected to be. By then, after nearly 12 days of being in the jungle, Bat-21 Bravo was a shell of a man, 45 pounds lighter and with a broken wrist, but alive. Quickly, Norris and Wynn put the near-delirious injured pilot in the sampan, covered him with light vests, bamboo, and vegetation, and began their just as perilous journey back, sneaking past enemy rocket positions and even evading a North Vietnamese patrol that tried to stop them. However, with daylight approaching, Norris knew his dangers grew, and their disguise would not hold much longer. After notifying the base that Bat-21 Bravo had been recovered, aircraft were told to stand by to lend fire support, just in case. And just as the trio approached the relative safety of the forward operating base, the sampan came under attack by heavy machine gun fire, raining from a North Vietnamese bunker. Knowing just how close they were to finishing their days-long mission, Norris beached the vessel and told the men to hide. The American SEAL then called in an airstrike on the enemy bunker, which also provided a smokescreen. With this, the trio finally had their chance to get back into the sampan and began the last rush to safety. Once near the base, with Hamilton so injured he could not walk, South Vietnamese soldiers ran down the hill to carry him back to safety, where he was prepared for evacuation. After returning to safety, with Hamilton as well as Clark safe and sound, receiving medical care in the security of a base, Norris was met by a CBS News reporter who was shocked that the tired-looking SEAL had made not one but three trips right into the thick of the battle, telling him, quote, It must have been rough out there. I bet you wouldn't do that again. However, without hesitation, Tommy Norris looked the journalist right in the eyes and replied, quote, An American was down in enemy territory. Of course I'd do it again. Unbeknownst to Norris, soon it would be him who would need saving. Only six months after Navy SEAL Lieutenant Thomas Norris's heroic actions, the same area where he encountered the enemy forces had fallen deeper under North Vietnamese control. Because of this, gathering any kind of intelligence regarding enemy plans, targets, and movements in the area was paramount. But doing so would be dangerous, and the few aircraft that dared to fly over couldn't get an accurate picture. Norris would have to dive into the jungle once more. Thus, on October 31st, a small commando team formed by the lieutenant 
alongside three South Vietnamese SEALs and fellow American Petty Officer Michael Thornton, ventured just south of the DMZ to gather as much intelligence as they could. At the time, Thornton was well aware of his fellow Navy SEALs' endeavors, as Tommy Norris had become a sort of legend amongst the military circle. But knowing the April story, he also knew that they were entirely on their own. By sunset, the five-person team approached the area via the sea, using a junk boat for the initial journey. Subsequently, they transferred to a rubber boat and paddled closer to their target. The final step involved swimming the remaining distance to reach their destination. But as the night went on, the team became confused. When the sun rose again on November 1st, they realized they were not in the DMZ, but five miles to the north and well inside North Vietnam. Before the group even had time to process this, a small North Vietnamese patrol saw them and alerted all enemy troops to their position. With their cover blown, the five-man team held off a 300-strong force for nearly four hours, calling on naval firepower to stay alive. Realizing they needed to withdraw, Norris volunteered to protect the rear while the others moved towards the water. But as soon as he did so, a bullet reached Lieutenant Norris's head and rendered immobile, he fell on his back. Through the noise, one of the South Vietnamese men told Thornton that Norris was gone. However, as a U.S. Navy SEAL, he knew there was no way he'd leave Norris behind. With no time to lose and risking his own life in the process, Thornton ran right through the endless fire towards his fallen comrade's body. However, upon encountering him, he realized Tommy was barely alive. Now more determined than ever, Thornton, a strong man, lifted his lieutenant's body over his shoulder and began the trek back toward the rest of his team. With bullets raining all around them, as he ran back to the sand dunes where the other men were, with his free hand, the petty officer fired his own weapon, taking down several North Vietnamese. By some miracle, neither Thornton nor the wounded Norris were hit. For the next part of their journey back, Thornton plunged into the ocean waters, dragging his unconscious lieutenant behind him, keeping his head above water as best he could with the help of a life vest, and swam desperately for safety. When he spotted a wounded team member, Thornton did not hesitate to tow him as well. But not willing to give up just yet, the North Vietnamese continued to fire at the fleeing group as they swam away, not stopping until they were well beyond their firing range. By the time the junk boat that had dropped them off rescued them, Thornton had been supporting two men on his own for over two hours. Officer Thornton was recommended for the Medal of Honor for his adherence to a fundamental Navy SEAL principle. He refused to leave the wounded Lieutenant Norris behind. Less than a year later, on October 15, 1973, he was summoned to the White House to receive the prestigious award. At the nearby Bethesda Navy Hospital, Tommy Norris was still recuperating from his injuries. His condition was so severe that he was denied his request to be temporarily released for Thornton's ceremony. But once again, Thornton refused to leave Norris behind and practically kidnapped him for the day. Once at the White House, President Richard Nixon bestowed the Medal of Honor upon Navy Lieutenant Michael Edwin Thornton. Standing to the side, the wounded but proud Norris watched as the man who saved his life was decorated with the nation's highest honor. Despite Lieutenant Norris's repeated insistence that he did not deserve the Medal of Honor, he was awarded the prestigious honor by President Gerald Ford on March 6, 1976 for his courageous actions in rescuing Lieutenant Mark Clark and Lieutenant Colonel ICL Hamilton. With this, Thornton's rescue became one of the only times in history when one Medal of Honor recipient saved another. The October 1972 ordeal caused Tommy Norris to lose an eye and part of his skull. He spent the better part of six years in and out of hospitals and medically retired from the Navy. In the fall of 1979, Norris approached FBI Director William Webster and requested a waiver for his injuries. Webster told him that he would only if he passed the same test as anybody else applying for this organization. Sure enough, the sharpest attack Norris passed the test with flying colors and became an FBI special agent for the next two decades, becoming the foundation of the organization's hostage rescue team as an assault team leader. Speaking at a Navy event, Norris once discussed what the Medal of Honor means to him, quote, I wear it for the members of my teams and the people that served as valiantly and will never have the chance to wear an award like that. There are those out there who deserved it but were never recognized and the folks that gave their lives for the missions they were sent on who will never be back again. It's an honor for me to wear it, but I don't consider it mine. 